Hello guys, this is Indian Medico and in this video, we are going to see about non-infective inflammatory diseases of orbit. First, let us discuss about idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease. It is abbreviated as IOID. It is also known as non-specific orbital inflammation or orbital serotumor. It is an uncommon disorder in which there is non-neoplastic, non-infective, space-occupying orbital infiltration with inflammatory features. It can involve any or all of the orbital soft tissues. Histopathology of idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease shows pleomorphic inflammatory cellular infiltration followed by reactive fibrosis. It is unilateral in adults whereas it can be bilateral in children. Intracranial extension is rare in case of idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease and simultaneous orbital and sinus involvement is also rare. Now let us discuss the symptoms of IOID. There can be acute or subacute ocular and periocular redness, swelling and pain as you can see in this picture. Systemic symptoms can occur in children. Signs of IOID include pyrexia in case of children, congestive proptosis, mild to severe ophthalmoplegia. There can be features of optic nerve dysfunction, especially when the inflammation involves posterior orbit. There can be optic disc swelling and choroidal folds, which can lead to reduced vision. Now, let us discuss about the cause of IOID. There can be three possible outcomes. The first one is spontaneous remission after a few weeks without sequelae. The second one is intermittent episodes of activity usually with eventual remission and the third one is severe prolonged inflammation leading to progressive fibrosis of orbital tissues which eventually leads to frozen orbit. The features of frozen orbit are ophthalmoplegia, ptosis and visual impairment which is caused by optic nerve involvement. Now let us discuss the investigations done for a case of IOID. CT can be done which shows ill-defined orbital opacification and loss of definition of contents. This picture shows CT of a case of IOID, this is the axial view and this is the coronal view. As you can see, there is orbital opacification. Biopsy can be done to confirm the diagnosis and to rule out neoplasia and systemic inflammatory conditions. The differential diagnosis of IOID include infection, lymphoma, non-neoplastic infiltrative disorders such as sarcoidosis and vaginal granulomatosis. Now let us discuss about the treatment of IOID. For mild diseases, observation can be done. Mild diseases can also be treated with NSAIDs alone, example ibuprofen. NSAIDs should always be combined with proton pump inhibitor. Systemic steroids can be started for moderate disease, but systemic steroids should be started only after the diagnosis has been confirmed. This is because systemic steroids can mask other pathologies such as infection and vaginal granulomatosis. The dose of systemic steroids is oral prednisolone 1 to 1.5 mg per kilogram per day which should be tapered and discontinued over weeks depending on the clinical response. For recurrent cases, we can use orbital deposteroid injection and radiotherapy. Radiotherapy can also be initiated when there is no improvement after two weeks of adequate steroid therapy. For resistant cases, we can use cytotoxic drugs like methotrexate and azathioprine. We can also use calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin and tacrolimus. We can also use biological blockers. For highly resistant cases, we can do surgical resection of an inflammatory focus. Now let us discuss about orbital myositis. It is idiopathic non-specific inflammation of one or more extraocular muscles. It is basically a subtype of IOID. Histopathology of orbital myositis shows chronic inflammatory cellular infiltrate associated with muscle fibers as you can see in this picture. The symptoms of orbital myositis include acute pain which is exasperated by eye movement and diplopia. The onset of orbital myositis is in early adulthood. The signs of orbital myositis are less when compared to IOID. There can be lid edema, ptosis and chemosis. There can be pain and diplopia associated with eye movements. There will be vascular injection over involved muscle. As you can see in this picture, there is vascular injection over the right medial rectus. In chronic cases, there can be fibrosis of affected muscle leading to permanent restrictive myopathy. Now let us discuss about the cause of orbital myositis. There can be two possible outcomes. There can be acute non-recurrent involvement that results spontaneously within six weeks or it can lead to chronic disease characterized by either a single episode persisting for longer than two months or recurrent attacks. CT or MRI can be done to diagnose orbital myositis. CT shows enlargement of affected muscles with or without involvement of tendons of insertion. This picture shows orbital myositis involving right medial rectus. As you can see, there is Enlargement of the affected muscle. Remember, in case of thyroid eye disease, the tendon is always bad, whereas in case of orbital myositis, it may or may not involve the tendons. Now, let us discuss about the treatment of orbital myositis. 
the treatment is aimed at relieving discomfort and dysfunction and for shortening course and preventing recurrences. Inositis can be given for mild disease. Systemic steroids can be started in case of moderate disease and systemic steroids produce dramatic improvement. Recurrence rate is around 50% and for recurrent cases we have to give radiotherapy. Now let us discuss about acute dacryoadenitis. Dacryoadenitis means inflammation of the lacrimal gland. It can be idiopathic or due to viral causes such as mumps, Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus or rarely it can be due to bacterial infection. Remember, in case of idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease, the lacrimal gland is often involved. Chronic conditions such as sarcoidosis, Froggen syndrome, thyroid disease and some chronic infections usually give a less acute onset and involvement can be bilateral. Now let us discuss about the presentation of a case of acute dacryoadenitis. In acute cases, there will be rapid onset of discomfort in region of gland. There can be reduced or increased lacrimal secretion with discharge. There will be swelling of lateral aspect of eyelid overlying the palpebral lobe leading to the characteristic S-shaped ptosis as you can see in this picture. There can be enlargement of orbital lobe which can lead to slight downward and inward dystopia, proptosis and other signs of orbital disease. There can be tenderness or lacrimal gland and injection of conjunctiva overlaying palpebral lobe which can be seen on upper lid eversion. As you can see in this picture, there is injection of conjunctiva overlaying the palpebral lacrimal lobe. Other clinical features include chemosis and preauricular lymph node enlargement. CT in case of acute dacryoadenitis shows enlargement of gland and involvement of adjacent tissues without bony erosion. This picture shows CT of acute dacryoadenitis. As you can see, there is enlargement of the lacrimal gland and involvement of adjacent tissue. Remember, if bony erosion is present, it suggests a tumor. Biopsy can be done to exclude a tumor. We have to treat the cause and in most cases, treatment is not required for acute dacryoadenitis. Now, let us discuss about Tolosa Hunt syndrome. It is a rare idiopathic condition. In Tolosa Hunt syndrome, there is non-specific granulomatous inflammation of cavernous sinus or superior orbital fissure or orbital apex. It is basically a diagnosis of exclusion, so the case should be investigated fully. Now let us discuss about the presentation of Tolosa Hunt syndrome. There can be ipsilateral periorbital or hemicranial pain and diplopia due to ocular motor paresis. There can be associated pupillary and eyelid involvement in many cases. Other clinical features include mild proptosis. Sensory loss along the first and second branches of the trigeminal nerve, and there can be pyrexia. Now, let us discuss about the diagnosis of Tolosa Hunt syndrome. Imaging can be done, and we have to rule out identifiable causes, including neoplasia. Remember, Tolosa Hunt syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, let us discuss about the treatment of Tolosa Hunt syndrome. We can treat Tolosa Hunt syndrome with systemic steroids and other immunosuppressants. However, there can be remissions and recurrences. This picture shows a case of Tolosa Hunt syndrome. As you can see, there is left palpebral ptosis and exotropia of left eye. There is also paresis of third, fourth, and sixth left cranial nerves. Now, let us discuss about granulomatosis with polyangitis. It is also known as vaginal granulomatosis. It is an idiopathic multisystem granulomatous disorder. It can involve orbit bilaterally by contiguous spread from paranasal sinuses or nasopharynx. Primary orbital involvement is less common. Remember, granulomatosis with polyangitis or vaginal granulomatosis should be considered in any patient with bilateral orbital inflammation, particularly if it is associated with sinus pathology. We can do C and C, that is anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody test to confirm vaginal granulomatosis. Other ocular features in vaginal granulomatosis include scleritis, peripheral ulcerative keratitis, intraocular inflammation and retinal vascular occlusions. This picture shows a case of vaginal granulomatosis. As you can see, there is nodular scleritis. There is also enhancement of sclera and orbital apex seen on MRI. Now, let us discuss about the treatment of vaginal granulomatosis. We have to treat vaginal granulomatosis with cyclophosphamide and steroids. For resistant cases, we can give cyclosporin, azathioprine, antithymocyte globulin or plasmapheresis. Surgical decompression can be done when there is severe orbital involvement. Thank you.